and welcome to Cooper Union. Today we're looking at the UN General Assembly 75th opening week, and we'll be looking at what's happening with human rights around the world. I'm very fortunate that on this opening day of the UN General Assembly, we're able to welcome the director of the New York office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Craig, thank you so much and welcome to Cooper Union. Gosh, great to be here. Nice to see you again. What does it feel like in New York? I know usually this time of year, we'd all be excited, except of course the people who live on the east side of New York. It's known sort of as the World Cup of social justice. What does it feel like now with COVID? And what's really, why should the world know what's happening on the 75th anniversary of the UN General Assembly? Well, it's, it's a perfect question at a perfect moment, Josh. I have to tell you, this is a very strange General Assembly this year. I'm a half a block from the United Nations building right now. And normally this entire neighborhood for blocks and blocks and blocks is sealed off with heavy security and cement barriers and trucks uh, uh, blocking the streets and so on. And today is just another day because for the first time now in 75 years, today is, this is the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, uh, and, and of the General Assembly, uh, there's nobody in the building. So this year, you know, it's going to be a very, very strange exercise. You can imagine all of the important issues that are on the agenda, but uh, many of those discussions have actually been either postponed or, or canceled. You know, everything from counterterrorism discussions, some discussions around the sustainable development goals, reform of the General Assembly, even discussions on racial discrimination, um, uh, on uh, harmony with nature, a whole range of really, you know, essential issues have had to be pushed back because after all, uh, the global pandemic is what it is. And here in New York, we're still in a partial uh, lockdown. So it's going to be a strange one, Josh. No, and it, it's one of those things. This is the time of year when heads of state come from all over the world. Almost every NGO, we the people come there to make sure that our voice is heard. So how are we coping with that? And how are NGOs and civil society still participating around the UN General Assembly? Are things going virtual? And uh, maybe you can share some insights on that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the issue of the heads of state and government who are normally here uh, speaking one by one in front of the General Assembly in that historic chamber, they will be participating this year virtually. They'll be submitting videos and feeds and so on from wherever they are around the world. And so you don't have that diplomatic presence that's normally uh, here. And I think one of the toughest tests is gonna be exactly the participation of the public, civil society, NGOs, because as it stands now, there is no NGO or civil society access to the General Assembly directly. Now, you know, there may be some side events where civil society voices are heard, uh, you know, virtually through Zoom and other uh, media like that, um, but what they'll be missing is that access, that opportunity to have face-to-face -face contact, to influence policy, to try to influence the resolutions that are being adopted in the General Assembly. And frankly, that's the piece I worry about the most. And it's not just civil society. It's normally we have all of the independent human rights mechanisms of the UN who come here, who speak publicly, who engage with the delegations, and who influence what's happening. And in a moment when human rights of all kinds are challenged all around the world, not having that direct interaction, those corridor conversations, those bilateral meetings, uh, those points of access, that worries me quite a bit, I have to say. Yeah, no, I know this is the time where, you know, there's are you always the protest outside. So civil society gathers outside. They have right. the protest when their head of state is coming to raise awareness because otherwise very few people keep track of all the different talks and who speaks. And then those side events at the church center, but also many side events inside in the basement of the UN. So it's a definite challenge, but I know civil society is very active. Uh, I know we're organizing the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Global Human Rights Annual Summit. It'll be the fifth annual, but yeah, it's, it's then connecting with missions and we have a couple of missions partnering on different panels. So it's a, it's a new beast, but I think it's important that the UN has actually been very responsible looking at the COVID crisis from a human rights perspective. Can you maybe share how the human rights framework is an asset as we're trying to combat this crisis? Because I know it's, it hit New York, of course, so hard. We watched it very much in March and April and May and June. Our hearts were breaking here in Hawaii. And it, of course, is still going on around the world with more surges in Europe right now. But what's the human rights approach and why is it so valuable as we're approaching this crisis? 
Yeah, it's been very difficult here. I mean, I have to see, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged by how New York City and other, some other cities around the world have gotten back up on their feet uh, after having been devastated. New York is one of those cities that was hardest hit. And, you know, we were all locked in here for months at a time uh, during a period of great fear and, and trepidation. And I think what we learned from this is that, you know, really 40 years of ignoring international human rights standards in the way we structure our economic systems, in the way we structure healthcare, and the way we structure uh, our, our politics, because what we've learned is one of the most important you know, vectors for this virus is discrimination, is inequality. Uh, I mean, the human rights uh, um, uh, framework appears, is forced to appear at the center of anybody's analysis of this pandemic, because we see who's hardest hit. Who are the people that have been most affected? And you know, uh, public health professionals will tell you that it is, in the first instance, yes, older persons who are suffering from their own discrimination, marginalization, uh, ageism, and being sacrificed by public policies as if they matter less than, than the rest of, of society. Um, we see it's people with pre-existing uh, health conditions, some of whom are persons with disabilities who also have been subjected to that kind of marginalization, exclusion, and discrimination in violation of international human rights standards. But that third category is people of lower socioeconomic status, people who are living in poverty or in precarity, people who don't have the benefit of social distancing, people who either have to go to work or they don't eat, people who are on the front lines, who are who are, after all, caregivers, who are, after all, people who are working in the stores, keeping the, flute, the food uh, flowing and, and, and so on, they have been the hardest hit by that. And, you know, in countries like the United States, that socioeconomic status tracks very closely to ethnic and racial status. We see that it is people of color in this country who have been most devastated by uh, the effects of the virus, who've been hit the hardest, hit the most, suffered the highest. Uh, fatality rates uh, and illness rates and infection rates and, and so on. That all relates to a failure before the pandemic arrived to enforce human rights in our civil, political, economic, social, or cultural systems in this country and in, in countries around the world. So those things, this idea of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that the job of governance is to assure freedom from fear and freedom from want without discrimination, that's where the failure has shown itself. And an economic system which is unable to provide uh, um, health care as a human right to all people in the country, that is unable to provide essential materials like masks and personal protection uh, uh, equipment and uh, that, uh, um, uh, medical equipment, all of those, those sorts of things, is a system which has failed to deliver on the promises of the international human rights regime. And I would just add to that, uh, Josh, not only is the foundation for failure uh, in this pandemic been laid for 40 years, uh, 50 years, uh, because of neglecting human rights in, in those issues. Um, the response has been very flawed as a result of neglecting serious human rights considerations about inequality, about discrimination, and again, about the delivery of healthcare, not as a commodity for sale to those who can afford it, not as a privilege for elites who are born into it, but as a fundamental human rights to which we are all entitled uh, uh, just by virtue of being born human and without discrimination. Excellent points, Craig, especially you're highlighting the civil and political rights as racism being a pre-existing condition, but also bringing up the point really of, it makes me think of Roosevelt Island, you know, just off there and the freedom of speech, freedom of worship, but freedom from fear and freedom from want. Those four freedoms and that address to Congress, absolutely crucial. Those economic, social and cultural rights that were addressed by Roosevelt at that time, but then also very important as you brought up the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Eleanor Roosevelt attending that meeting in San Francisco with those 42 NGOs pushing, understanding through the Great Depression how, you know, even today, you can't talk about how you can combat the crisis or survive and thrive during this crisis when you're saying the first thing you have to do is wash your hands and there's no right to clean water in the US. And you could see the situation that I know OHA has been involved with in Flint and other communities. And then also the other important aspect of right to housing and the United States forgetting that economic, social and cultural rights are a significant element of human rights according to the Vienna Conference are interconnected and indivisible and that we have to have all those. And I think you really brought all of that together quite well. And the other aspect is even older persons. I know there's a convention coming around on that. So 
you know, we look at what's going on and you heard Anandati Roy talking about this portal. The pandemic is a portal and how we'll move forward. But I think you really bring up the point, we have to think about equality, about equity. And that's where human rights framework is so powerful that people have these rights. And that's the role of government to guarantee those rights and provide those. So we really appreciate you looking at that and maybe you can add a little more to those points. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's a, it's a good time to ask these questions because as we said, it's the 75th anniversary of the organization. And the United Nations was not founded as a conference center or uh, uh, as just a, a place to consolidate the power of governments. The United Nations was an idea. Uh, and as you say, Eleanor Roosevelt um, uh, and, and others uh, from this country were very much involved in designing the architecture of the organization around this idea that, you know, what had led to the horrors that the world had experienced before the establishment of the United Nations, everything from, you know, world wars to a massive depression around the world, to colonialism, to slavery, to, uh, uh, you know, institutionalized racial discrimination. This was supposed to be a new idea that would address that, that would say, yes, you know, everybody is entitled to health and education and housing and water and sanitation um, and fair trial and not to be abused by the police and not to be subjected to torture and to have a say in their government. You know, all of these things were defined by the United Nations, by the original vision of the United Nations as fundamental human rights, not privileges, but that's something that we, we are all entitled to. And that where there are disputes, those disputes need to be resolved peacefully through international cooperation and under a framework of international law. Because remember, this human rights stuff is not just ethics or good feeling, it's international law as a result of you know, the work of the United Nations over the course of the last um, 75 years. That's the, that's the plan. But the reality that people in our world today are confronting is so far away from that plan. And I think it's right that the pandemic has laid bare the degree to which we have moved away from that original vision of, um, of the United Nations, that we have uh, stripped the capacity of the state to deliver on economic and social rights, to fight the massive inequalities that have now reached feudal uh, proportions all around us, to try to dismantle uh, white supremacy in our structures and in our cultures, to try to deal with gender inequality, the continued you know, dispossession and persecution of indigenous peoples. These are all a part of the original idea, but I fear at 75 years on, we've actually been moving further away from this vision rather than closer to it. It's a good point. I mean, in the UN Charter, of course, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, what was significant in San Francisco is it did start with we the peoples. And of course, the UN, of course, is a gathering of governments, but it is amazing the ability for civil society and people's movements to impact and change those global structures. Maybe you could share some ideas of some of the human rights movements around the world and how they've been able to have an impact at the global level and how maybe they connect with common challenges and then create campaigns together. Yeah, I think that's such a crucial point. You know, I mean, if the vision of the UN is going to be saved, it will be saved by we the peoples. It's not going to be saved by governments. It's not going to be saved by corporations. It's not going to be saved by experts. It's going to be saved by the mobilization of people in specific movements and in broader social justice and human rights movements. And, you know, to some degree, that's always been the case, even in the drafting of the charter, even in in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the voice of civil society, uh, the voices of people advocating uh, on behalf of human rights actually influenced the content of those documents. And that has continued very, very much in the human rights part of the organization where you know, voices of civil society have been intimately involved in the design of the human rights mechanisms, those, those mechanisms that monitor human rights around the world human rights instruments, the treaties, the declarations, the guidelines, and so on. Uh, that much of that has grown out of, um, of civil society demands. And the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals themselves, you know, when that initiative started to draft a kind of an agenda for the entire world on how to deal with the problems of environment and climate and water and sanitation and health and housing and uh, um, international cooperation, all those sorts of things. It started out as a very conservative vision. It's only because a participatory process was adopted where millions of people, from, literally millions of people from around the world participated that you ended up with a very progressive, human-centered and ambitious agenda that says, 
we're going to deal with economic and social and civil and political rights and the right to development. We're going to deal with the environment. We're going to deal with nature. We're going to deal with all of these issues that may be sensitive to governments or governments may be reticent to make progress on, but we're going to demand that. And that's, you know, without that, without the soul of the UN, which is the voices of civil society, of social movements, of human rights movements, of human rights defenders, of land defenders, of water defenders, of indigenous defenders, without them, the UN becomes a bureaucratic um, uh, nightmare, frankly, instead of the hope that the charter promises it to be. And it's great that you brought up the sustainable development goals, because I know I was there in Rio, where they were saying we'd follow up on the Millennium Development Goals. And there are some important elements of sustainable development goals of furthest behind first, leave no one behind. And of course, human rights activists were very involved from Rio Plus 20 throughout the process. And of course, we're also commemorating the fifth anniversary on 25 September. Maybe is there anything going on to commemorate the 25 September adoption? And I think we also kick off the decade of action. Yeah, there'll be some conversations happening in the General Assembly. As I mentioned in the beginning, some of those are being postponed. Uh, you know, with the hope that there will be more control of the pandemic that will allow face-to-face -face meetings and more participation. But we will see over the course of the next few weeks a number of conversations around that. You mentioned uh, an important event that uh, you're involved in, but there'll be some, some uh, official events uh, of the member states uh, as well. And as you say, you know, the decade, the decade of action, this idea that, you know, we are now uh, five years into it, we're not as far along as we need to be. And we need to have some catalytic action to try to force all of the partners involved in the Sustainable Development Goals to push this agenda forward. We've been derailed to a certain degree uh, by the events and not just the pandemic, but uh, the financial crisis that's come you know, along with the, the pandemic that we've been expecting all along anyway. Uh, the unrest that we see in a number of countries for failure to deliver on this, uh, on, on this vision. Uh, but we really have to get that thing up and uh, up and running. We don't have much uh, time left. And, you know, fair, it's fair to say that the issues that are addressed in the Sustainable Development Goals, like the Human Rights Instrument, are existential issues. If we don't get a handle on climate change, all of this just becomes an academic conversation. It will undo uh, any hope of, of realizing the other goals. If we don't get a handle on inequalities under Goal 10 of the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, it will erode the hope of, of realizing those goals uh, across the board even further. And as you say, the objective is to reach the furthest behind first, not to just look at aggregates and say, look how successful we are, we are when millions and millions of people are left in poverty, millions more in, in precarity, millions more without their rights realized. How can you call that a success? You know, uh, not to mention the environmental uh, degradation that we continue to suffer globally. Oh, excellent points. And really, you brought up some things that are quite crucial because the 23rd is also uh, the anniversary of the first climate action summit where Ban Ki-moon had gone to Oceania. He had visited here and seen firsthand how indigenous peoples and Pacific Islanders are on the front lines of climate change. And then, of course, last year, that amazing climate action summit as well, hosted by Antonio Guterres. And he also came to Fiji and to the Pacific, as well as Special Rapporteur on human rights and environment, Boyd came to Fiji to see where people are already moving. And then of course, it's important to know, I think you really raised it, it is an existential threat. Right now, the United States, you have the highest air pollution in the world from the wildfires, and you see fire NATOs, new terms coming up, you see climate crisis, and you were on the 15th anniversary of Katrina, where I really think a lot of those economic, social, and cultural rights and internally displaced peoples all those frameworks really did help people, all that work of working on the elements and seeing how the whole world is in the same boat in a way, the small blue planet, and we recognize the fragility, and that's why fundamental freedoms are a way to move forward. Yeah, I mean, the whole world is in the same boat, but some, some have not been given life vests, uh, and, and the, the water level is getting higher inside the boat every, every single day, and uh, you know, it's trying to uh, help to wake up those in positions of privilege who have the life vests and uh, who knows, helicopters hovering above uh, and, and making them realize that uh, that time is running out. I think that is the, that is the, real, uh, the real challenge in all of this. Uh, I mean, I, um, I think if I'm encouraged by anything, Josh, it's, it's not the official conferences, the cops and so on uh, that have proceeded around these issues but it is the mobilization of people 
um, uh, young people, of course, but, but people from all walks of life now who have begun to realize and, uh, you know, the, the real, as you say, existential threat, and have begun to put pressure on government, on international institutions and others uh, to really act. And I, I you know, um, I'm all for diplomacy. I'm all for uh, the use of international law. But I also believe we've reached a point in history where the time is basically up. And that means sometimes disruption, civil disobedience, sometimes that means mass action is the only way to wake up those who are asleep at the switch uh, before, before it's too late for all of us. And these global conferences, including the General Assembly and so on, you know, they're an opportunity to shine a light um, uh, on these, these threats to our society and on the vision, uh, the positive vision that we want to realize for, for our world. Uh, but they will only work if the pressure is, is kept on, if the movements uh, keep on the pressure. And uh, I'm very happy to say that with, you know, with regard to the climate, we are seeing those gro growing movements. You know, just last year, we actually had a, a coming together of the, let's say, the international human rights movement and the international environmental movement who came together in a series of meetings to try to look at how to merge, as you know, the, the respective strengths uh, uh, and resources of, of those movements, recognizing that you know, climate change is a threat to every single human right guaranteed in the Universal Declaration. Many are already losing their, their rights. Many have already lost their lives. Uh, and so this imposes a positive obligation on every state member of the UN to take the steps necessary to, to address the climate crisis in order to protect those rights. I think that's actually a great point. And that's usually how we do see the UN General Assembly. It's an opportunity to organize. And I did attend that meeting at NYU last year. And that was a very important step because a lot of people moved beyond polar bears and penguins to the indigenous peoples and who are impacted right now. And I agree with you. It's really, besides an opportunity to organize human rights, and that's what its, its strength is, right? It's a shield to protect, but it's also a star to guide us on how to move forward. It's a floorboard of fundamental freedoms that no one should ever fall below, but also a horizon we can aim for to make life on this earth as amazing as possible. And so I really do see that point that it's also the civil and political rights of the direct action. Uh, when the governments do not listen, that is why you do have to shut things down. And I, one of my best memories of knowing you over the decades is uh, flying in from Geneva and then going with you later that afternoon with a special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights to occupy Wall Street. And that's one of the aspects that I really appreciate about many of the people that work at High Commissioner for Human Rights. It, it's not a job, it's a pursuit of justice. And maybe you can highlight a little bit about the Occupy Wall Street and maybe why that's even more relevant again today with the pandemic and some of those points connecting those two movements of the 99% demanding justice. Yeah, I think it's true what you say. You know, if you, if you peek behind the curtain in the United Nations and particularly in the Human Rights Office of the United Nations, you'll find people like you find everywhere. There will be people who are there for personal ambitions or affiliation with a particular government or an academic interest in the issues. But the engine of these organizations has always been that core of people who are there, frankly, for ideological reasons, who are there because they just can't tolerate injustice. They, uh, they really believe in human rights. They really believe in, in equality. And they would be doing that work whether they, it was their career or not, because they, uh, they just have an intolerance for intolerance, if I can, if I can put it that way. Um, and I think that, that really, in every organization, that is what, um, that is what makes, the, uh, makes the difference. I think Occupy Wall Street was, uh, people view it as something that was a blip on the radar. I think it was the beginning of something very important. I mean, that was a recognition by people that what was happening with the consolidation of power and wealth in all of our societies over a period of four or five decades was leading us uh, in a catastrophic direction that this tendency to move away from the vision of the Universal Declaration that, as we said, guarantees water and sanitation and healthcare and housing and jobs and so on as a human right, and into a vision that was all about moving authority and resources away from the public sector and the people and into the hands of large corporations and a smaller and smaller slice of wealthy elites in society that that approach was resulting in an undercutting of the full range of human rights. Not only was it undercutting those economic and social rights by privatization, deregulation, liberalization, um, the destruction of labor unions uh, and, and labor rights. Um, so it was definitely devastating economic and social rights, but it was also devastating civil and political rights because 
what you had was an increasing capture of the levers of government and public decision making by a smaller and smaller and more wealthy and powerful uh, elite. So, you know, what difference does it make if you cast a vote uh, on, on polling day, if the real policy decisions are being made by, you know, large corporations, wealthy individuals, um, uh, and the public, uh, you know, action committees that they, that they fund. Um, that is, that's a capture of the levers of government that are supposed to be there to guarantee your human rights and increasingly are, are failing to do so. That was something that the people at Occupy that you and I, uh, you know, had a great privilege, I think, to be present for, uh, understood earlier than, than many others. Um, now, the problem is that none of the fundamentals uh, uh, that brought about the 2008 financial crisis that devastated people's rights around the world, none of those fundamentals have been changed. We have still not moved into a system in most countries where economic and social rights are truly realized, where civil and political rights are truly protected. Uh, and we are headed for, I, it seems to me, inevitably a similar crisis. Uh, if we don't really turn up the heat, uh, as it were, if we don't assert our demands for human rights, civil, political, economic, um, social and, and cultural. And I think what they did influenced very much, you mentioned the special rapporteur on, uh, on poverty, a number of other international human rights mechanisms who have picked up uh, on, that, on that demand, on that, on that message, and are more and more integrating that into the work uh, that human rights people are doing all, all around the world. But we've got a long way to go before we can even claim a, a modest amount of victory. We do, and I think that brings up a great point. I think people could look at also the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment, I mean, Special Rapporteur and Extreme Poverty visit to the United States recently, yeah. which of course sparked uh, a response of withdrawing from the Human Rights Council. And I know we only have a minute left, but that's a great thing. I know we could meet again and maybe do a follow-up after the UN General Assembly, but the Je UN Human Rights Council started yesterday. I know there's a big topic there under agenda item number nine with the urgent debate follow-up. Could you briefly maybe share that? And we'll talk about that in more detail at the next uh, Cooper Union in two weeks. You know, that really points to the link between civil society and the United Nations because there's a long history in the UN of, um, for example, African Americans, indigenous Americans and others bringing their human rights claims to the UN because they say, look, this is not just a US civil rights. This is international human rights, and we, like any other people, have a right to bring those things forward. And so you saw through the years, you know, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Malcolm X, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Ralph Abernathy, other, you know, African-American leaders, lots of indigenous leaders bringing their claims to the, to the U.N. Well, that happened again after this series of uh, racist, I, I must say, killings of unarmed African-American men and women uh, over the course of the last um, few years where a coalition of civil society groups from the US, led by African-American uh, activists themselves, brought a claim to the Human Rights Council to take up this issue uh, this, this year. Uh, and the Human Rights Council adopted a specific resolution on how it's gonna follow up on the issue of, uh, of, of racism, white supremacy, police violence in the United States and elsewhere around the world. And this is the first session now that is going to review where we are in progress in that regard. And the High Commissioner will be reporting on that. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, this is Joshua Cooper with Cooper Union. This has been the United Nations General Assembly 75th opening week. And we thank you so much for coming and talking about us with what's happening with human rights around the world. Uh, we'll join you in two weeks. And mahalo, maluhi and mekapono. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. Good luck with the show. All right, aloha.